I'm going to be sharing about the trip that Luis and I took to Springfield, Ohio. And the title of the message just captures that. It's Love Goes Farther, Springfield, Ohio. And I kind of feel like I'm giving a book report. <laughs> I could get all my information and facts correct on you. Um, I, it, it's a little bit more of a serious message. Not that none of the rest are, but I feel like a deeper weight with it. And, um, but I still feel like I should deliver it. And I think um, it was just as we were worshiping and I was on the front row, looking back on some of the trips I've taken over my life, um, just after my first daughter was born, uh, on behalf of the newspaper, I went down to Honduras after Hurricane Mitch. And when I came back, I had a whole series of stories I wrote about. And the reporting of that was pretty straightforward. Hurricane bad, people's lives jeopardized, and that was a straightforward, people understood it. I think also of the time I went to Haiti after the earthquake in 2010. And I went on a mission trip with some Haitian leaders here and um, we went down to Haiti. It was, I'd always believed I would go to Haiti, like God had called me there. And when I went, we spent a week and was able to report that pretty straightforward in one sense. Straightforward in the sense that here's a, earthquake and a month later they were still struggling uh, to get back on their feet. There were still tremors with the earthquake. I remember that um, at one point the toughest guy in our group, he thought he was really tough until there was a tremor of an earthquake. And in the middle of the night we all woke up like this and Three seconds later, I saw this particular individual, some of you will know him, Sorrel. He was in the doorway, because that's where he's supposed to be the safest. And the, the moment really struck us all. We ended up sleeping on the stairs outside. Um, and I think about even when I went to El Paso, when I went to El Paso with Jono and Matt all those years ago, five years ago, it's pretty easy to describe to people the evil of a mass shooting. Uh, so you have an earthquake, you have a hurricane, you have a mass shooting, and those things feel like people can get that quickly. Um, I'm not so sure that when we go, because we feel like we're addressing another type of evil that was in Springfield, and that by addressing that evil, it's just as important. And I... I feel like it's so important to say it to the church. And you got to just know, quick, quick aside as a pastor, I think about people coming in and this is what they're weighing, this is what's weighing on them. And some of you came in today and you have your personal big challenges at home. It could be a relationship. It could be your finances. But I think, the, I think what helps get a message like this across to all of us is that when we see what's evil, God often draws us to see what's good. And when he draws us to see what's good, we see what's holy. And when we see what's holy, we see God. How many people want to see God? I'm going to need your help. I'm going to need your help. So I told you, I'm giving a book report, right? It's not a comedy routine. It's a book report, so to speak, on a mission that I believe that God wants, even in a small church like ours, to broadcast his holiness. And I guess one way to start it is by saying, how many people know that words matter? Has anybody ever said something to you that was spoken over your life that was false and it hurt and it's still there? Some of you, some of you are battling some things and you think the way to fix it's over here. But maybe one of the first things to fix is your mouth. Because the way that we speak to one another is really attracts something spiritual. And if we don't watch what we say, if our words are full of the wrong things, we're going to attract the wrong type of spiritual. But if we say the right things, then the Lord can move in that because his words to us are powerful. Can we say a big amen to them? His words to us bring life. There was an article in The Atlantic 
uh, by Russell Moore, who was an editor for Christianity Today. And he said the lies about Springfield, Ohio, is another test for Christian America. And I believe that with all my heart. It's another test for, for Christian America. I actually, were we able to sort the photo out? We've been, we have the photo. Can we just show that at the beginning here? So this is, I'm going to start with this. This is like an arc that I'm going to bring you through. So this is a woman that Luis and I met on day one. We went out. We were there for, we got there. Actually, in Springfield, we were only there for two days. And I felt like the most effective thing to do with that trip was to have three points of contact. Once one organization said, yes, we want you to come, that means a lot to us. I said, okay, we're not, we're not interfering, we're welcome. And so when we went, uh, we met this woman, and I don't really want to tell you too many details, except for three. She's a Haitian woman in Springfield, and she's a mother, and this is her daughter, uh, son, sorry, this is her son. Three details, that's all you need to know. When I go back to what's been being said about Springfield, I, there's been those horrible rumors. I can't, I don't even like to talk about what, the, what they were saying. And I think most of you know, but the, there was rumors that were really outlandish about the Haitian community there. And some of it, for some people, they're able to process it almost as in, uh, like with good humor, because it's like humor in the gallows, and, and I understand that. But many people were really hurting. And it wasn't just those particular lies. There was actually, double down, triple down, quadruple down lies about the people, about the mothers. About, by the way, our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Not just those people, brothers and sisters in Christ. And those rumors are, were lies, and the lies just basically said these people are destroying, they're violent, they're doing things to harm the community. And there was no, there's no evidence to support it. No evidence to support it. And basically, even the person who started the rumor said I was wrong about it. I heard it from somebody who heard it from somebody. Can I just, can I just give you an aside again? If you hear something, you heard it from somebody, you heard it from somebody else, you heard it from somebody else, you heard it from somebody else, nobody heard nothing about nothing. It's like, it's like that meme where it says, don't believe everything you read on the internet from Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> you know, he's never been on the internet, okay? So, you know, sometimes here's another thing I want to encourage you with. Sometimes when you're starting something, whether you're a leader, whether you're initiating a project, or you're stepping out in faith, sometimes that first step feels like the most foolish step. Sometimes that first step is not welcomed by the sound of applause, but the sound of crickets. And sometimes, even after a trip like that, by the time you get back, it's not applause, it's more silence. You have to be willing to be foolish in your faith. You have to be willing to let your reputation go to the side if you feel like God wants you to do something for his kingdom. So it says that this headline said it's another test for Christian America. Uh, and I think every test has questions, and I have two of them. When you hear the term biblical values, as you often do in, in this particular era, in this season, when you hear the term biblical values, what do you think of? That's my first question. You hear the term biblical values, what are the biblical values you think of? The second thing is, where in this life, I didn't mean to get into that whole part at the beginning when I was up here, but where in this life do you find God? And so I'm going to take you to Springfield. I got about 15 minutes, 17, 18 minutes to take you to Springfield. You all going to want to go with me to Springfield? I don't know if you do, but, but here we go. I got a tank. I got to fill it up before we get there. That's the first thing we're going to do. So we're going to fill the tank with some humility. Can we say amen to that? Amen. To get to, I want you to know 
what's stirring in Louisa and I, and what's stirring in us as we're trying to go to Springfield, Ohio. Hey, remember the mother and her son. We're trying to go to Springfield, Ohio to meet people and to do what we believe God has called us to do. No, it's not a mission trip following an earthquake or following a mass shooting or following uh, a hurricane, but it's following something else that's also destructive. And so we're going out there. We have these questions in our hearts. I want to bring you with me. We're going to fill the tank up with some humility. I have some reflections. One of the reflections is this. It is so hard for the church to examine its own sins. We love to examine the sins of everybody else. We love to examine the sins of those people, but not our own. But that's where revival begins. When you examine the sins of yourself. What does the Bible say about planks and specks? We have the plank, they have the speck. Did I get that right? We're the ones with the beams in our eyes. And really the humility, humility is beautiful. Can we just agree with that, a big amen? Now that's a characteristic of people who follow Jesus, but it's hard for the church to examine its own sins. So I told you it's going to be kind of a serious, significant type of message. I'm also going to just have to be brutally honest about some things. And over the course of my six years preaching here at Castle, I've gotten email and other types of communication from people who say, I wish you would preach about the sins of this. I wish you would preach about the sins of that. It's usually the left and the woke. I want you to preach about that. I rarely get, no, not even rarely. I've never gotten an email that says, how come we don't preach more about how to care for the poor? It's in the word how much Jesus came and cared for the poor. So now I'm going to do a little quick little thing I have here. Like, this is, this is part poetic, but I'm going to say it line for line. You ready? You said to call out sin, but when I did, you said not that sin, not my sin, and you left. You said to prophesy, but when the mothers cried from the streets, you closed your ears and you walked on by. You said to preach God's judgment against our enemies, but when I said Jesus told us to love them, you said that's too soft and you got angrier. You said to get back to the days of Holy Ghost fire, but when I said it's our own tongues that lit an unholy flame, you cursed and left. What we say can light a fire. Amen. So you all with me? I'm taking you to Springfield. We're filling up the tank. We're putting some humility in it. And I'm trying to describe another type of evil that is in our communities, and I'm doing it with as much humility as I know how. So we're going to fill the tank again with some hard truths. Some hard truths. Ready? James chapter 4, verses 11 to 12. Don't speak evil against each other. That is, see, this is what we do. We hear somebody say something about somebody else, and we go, oh, I just wish they wouldn't say that. God says, don't speak what? Dear brothers and sisters, if you criticize and judge each other, then you are criticizing and judging God's law. But your job is to obey the law, do what you got to do, not to judge whether it applies to you, not others. God alone, who gave, God alone, can everybody say God alone? God alone. Who gave the law is the judge. He alone has the power to save or to destroy. So what right do you have to judge your what? To speak evil is to talk down to somebody. And people in our society, and I'm not really worried so much about society, people in our churches have become dull to a particular kind of evil. And here's the truth. The moment you slander, you take the place of God in their life. I want you to think about that for a second. The moment you slander your brothers or sisters, we can, put, we can put the woman back up if we, if we got a chance. The mother. The moment you slander, the moment you slander, you, you say, God, would you step aside for a second? Because how does God treat us? God treats us with love. Can I hear you say amen to that? Yeah. 
He treats us with mercy. How many people know he's merciful? How many people know he's gracious? How many people know he's kind? How many people know that he is fair and just? But when we slander, we say, God, you got it wrong. I'm standing in the place, and I got something to say. And you know why that's evil? Because it's not your job. It's God's job. Can I hear you say amen? amen. Right. How are we doing? I'm basically saying it to myself. How are you doing, Adam? If you're willing to see, uh, Russell Moore said, if you're willing to see children terrorized because of a false rumor about Haitian immigrants, we should ask who abduct, abducted our conscience, not someone's pet. To sing praises, he goes on, to sing songs in a church service while trafficking in the bearing of false witness against people who fled for their life, who seek to rebuild a life for their children after crushing poverty and persecution is more than cognitive dissonance. It's modeling the devil himself whom Jesus called the what? The father of lies. And that's especially true when the lie harms another person. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, the apostle John wrote, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. I'm going to keep filling the tank up with some hard truths. Romans chapter, Romans chapter 1, verse 30. It says, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. There's this list that is written there in Romans about something that is the opposite of the Spirit of Christ. It's basically saying somebody who thinks this way does not think like Jesus would think. And so as Christians, I'm speaking to you as brothers and sisters. Our words are powerful. You can lift somebody up. You can stand for that truth about one another. Insolent is the word that I don't think I ever took a closer look at insolent. It means injurious. To say words that cause injury or lead to injury of some type. It's a lack of respect. Church, let's be respectful. Can I hear you say amen? Amen. Arrogant an exaggerated self-esteem. You should have good self-esteem, but an exaggerated self-esteem that shows up with contempt for others. Boastful. A boaster, guess what? It's somebody who gives himself credit in a loud and flaunting way. It's evil. That's evil. We like to pick our evils. This is evil, but this isn't that bad. Church, it shouldn't be in our church. And the reason why I'm standing here saying what I'm saying is because it's become normal in our church ears. And when it's normal in our church ears, I got to say something to remind you that the words that God speaks is nothing like what you just heard. It says, I was looking up, Jesus, how did you speak? And I looked it up. It says, uh, there was like this line that referred um, to when Jesus has a moment with the town. And it, let me just read the line. It says, Jesus' own townsfolk marveled at his what? At his gracious words. What, what does that mean? That means it's respectful. It carries himself. Said it kindly. Never to hurt somebody. Never to tear somebody down. He said it in such a way. The thing that moves me is, why was it such a marvel? Because sometimes gracious words don't come across as normal. They come across as a marvel. And so it says right before they tried to throw him over a cliff, they didn't receive his, their itching ears, wouldn't receive gracious words. All right, I got two more hard truths. Here we go. Mark chapter 15, verses 17 to 20. They put a purple robe on who? On Jesus. Then they twisted together a crown of thrones and set it on him, on Jesus. And they began to call out to him their words, Hail, King of the Jews. Again and again they struck him on the head with a staff, and they spit on him. Falling on their knees, they paid homage to him. And when they had finished mocking him, they took off the purple robe and put his own clothes on him. And then they led him out to crucify him. They mocked him. Mocking is evil. They were mocking him. The words are often coupled with violence. That's why there's 30-plus bomb threats in Springfield. Because it's coupled together. 
But Jesus, by the way, if you've ever been mocked, if you've ever been put down, I just want to say Jesus knows what it's like to be insulted. Amen. And Jesus knows what it's like to be himself weak and to be at the hands of somebody who seems more powerful. But Jesus alone is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And he has the power to speak life. We're filling up our tank. Here's a story that I think is so beautiful. It's from Ruth chapter 2, verses 10 to 13. Ruth, I'm not going to give you tons of context. I think it will come out of the scripture. Old Testament, Ruth fell at his feet. Whose feet? Boaz. Boaz is a picture and a type of who Jesus is like. Fell at his feet and thanked him warmly because she thanked Boaz because Boaz cared for Ruth. Ruth had left her country to go to another country. Ruth was said to her mother-in-law, wherever you go, I'm going to go. She said a type for us about how we should follow Jesus. Wherever you go, Lord, I'm going to go. And the word go is really important. Everybody say go. go. That's a part of your faith is the word go. And so she said, wherever you go, I'm going to go. And she says to Boaz, when Boaz saw that she was vulnerable, when Boaz saw that people were starting to say stuff about her, when Boaz saw that her life was under threat, when Boaz saw that there was a need, he reached out to her, the owner, the landowner, with a full staff. He said, what have I done, she says to him, to deserve such kindness? Can everybody say amen to the fact that Jesus is kind? Amen. And remember, Boaz is a type. She asked, I am only a foreigner. I'm less than all the people around me. And he says, I, I know what you're th thinking, Boaz replied. But I also know about everything you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband. I have heard how you left your, mother, your father and mother and your own land to live here among complete strangers. May the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Technically, we're all refugees because in Jesus we find our refuge and that makes us refugees and we come to take refuge, reward you fully for what you have done. I hope to continue to please you, sir, she replied. You have comforted me, watch, by speaking so kindly to me, even though I'm not one of your workers. Mm, church, speak kindly to people. It's not some kind of wimpy, soft, mixed up thing when you speak kindly you're fighting the forces of evil that would try to label people and put them down you speak kindly someone who has a spiritual mind who has self-control can step into a situation and even when they're insulted like our lord and savior was can still say father forgive them for they know not what they do You know what's amazing about this picture of Ruth? Her great-grandson is David, the line of Christ. And David says the same thing back to God. Ruth said to Boaz, who am I that you would take notice of me? By the way, take notice of people. Take notice of the mothers with their children. Take notice of our, notice of our brothers and sisters in Christ. Take notice of the human part of people, the human beings. She said, why would you take notice of me? And, and David said to God, who am I that you would think of me? Church, would we begin to adopt that mindset? To think the way that God wants us to think. Can we say amen to that? Amen. All right, so we filled up our gas tank. You ready? We filled up the gas tank, but I feel like you need a road trip movie. You know, like you do that with kids, you put the movie on because it's taking a long time, you want to keep them quiet, not like I'm trying to keep you, it would be nice if you stay kind of quiet. You guys all know the movie Inside Out, some of you, about the emotions, it's a cartoon animated one. I got three emotions to share with you briefly. Here's the road trip movie, Inside Out. I got three emotions. Number one is lament, number two is anger, and number three is hope. Number one, lament, is weeping over things that we should weep over. Because when it saddens our hearts, it's the door to change. And the church likes to clap quicker than they like to shed a tear 
For, and maybe you're not the tear shedding type. That's okay, although it wouldn't hurt you every now and then. Get an onion. I don't know what you got to do. But the church likes to do the clap songs, but the mourning and the lamenting is a part of Scripture. And some things should break your heart. Now, there's disputable matters about all types of evil. I'm focusing on one, and I think we can all agree this type of thing should break our hearts. Lament will lead to change. Oh, Lord, this is not the way it's supposed to be. Louisa, let's get in the car. We're taking a drive. Let's say something different than what they're hearing. Anger is my second emotion. I'm up here. I'm trying to smile. How am I doing? But I wouldn't be honest with you if I didn't feel, let you know I feel pretty angry. I feel pretty angry that this type of message has to pre be preached in church world because in church world our ears are getting deaf to this type of thing. And this type of thing is actually evil. And I feel angry. I feel angry that you don't need to get in the car to go to Springfield. You can get in the car and drive 20 minutes to the Mohegan Sun Arena where a Connecticut Sun played Indiana, whatever the team is there, with Caitlin Clark. And Caitlin Clark was playing another woman, defended by another woman whose last name is Carrington. And Carrington inadvertently poked her in the eye, left her with a bruise. Caitlin Clark afterwards said that was a basketball move. Caitlin Clark is white. Carrington is black. As... Carrington did that. From the arena, people started yelling out racial slurs at her from the arena 20 minutes away. And then she started fielding messages with racial slurs. And what happens is you think it, but somebody else says it, and so now you're in agreement, and it's normal. And it's not normal. I'm here to say it's not normal. And because it's evil... And what, what nobody would know is I know a little bit of the backstory. Carrington is the daughter, I think, of Darren Carrington. Darren Carrington is the family pastor at the Rock Church. The Rock Church helped us as a church do the third option about race relations and healing. That's the man's daughter that they're saying that against. And I've reached out to him just to say, I'm sorry that she had experienced that here in our backyard. And that's the anger, but the hope, the hope. Earlier this year, are you okay with me giving you another confession? Earlier this year, I had a moment of real despair. I was like, Lord, everything just feels so, like really, where are you, God? This has become normal. Where are you, God? And I had my moment of despair. And when you despair, God feels really far away. Anybody be, has anybody ever been there where he feels really far away? But we have the hope that's eternal because of the hope of the resurrection. And I went from where are you, God, to probably from a theological standpoint, the most happy I've ever been in my ministry. I'm learning from prophetic voices in the margins and discovering a message that represents the kingdom in all its beauty and majesty and power like never before. And I'm actually really happy to get rid of some misperceptions in my own life. I'm happy to say, Lord, I thought this, but this way I thought isn't correct. Thank you, Jesus, for giving me another step forward so I realize a little bit more about who you are. If you want God, you'll find him. If you seek righteousness, you're going to be filled with righteousness. And that is the hope that I would like to share with you all as a church. Amen? Thank you, brother. I feel like it's enough. We, put, we filled up the tank. I give you a road trip movie. And now I want to describe a sovereign moment by the time we get there. By the time we get there. And it makes me think of, as a police chaplain, I went to an ordination service, and uh, the pastor at this church was talking about police chaplains, but it applies to all of us. And he said, we show up in places to say the Lord hasn't left you. And that's for all of you. You don't got to get in a car and a drive. You can go out here and speak to somebody and say the Lord hasn't left you. The Lord hasn't left you. The Lord hasn't left any of you. Thank you, Jesus. The Lord hasn't left you. So we went, we talked with the pastor who leads a Haitian communities, a pastor, a pastor, a Haitian pastor, 
who leads the Haitian Community Center, who is talking about the effect of bomb threats from those lies and from those repeated lies and the effect on his children and the community's children. There are churches there who are banding together and saying, not in our city. This is what we believe, the God who sees. They're getting together to pray. We went over to the Haitian restaurant, uh, contact number two, and our waitress wasn't a hired waitress. She was a business owner, a Haitian woman who came to volunteer. They got together. In those spaces, I'm here to report to you that God is moving. The Haitian restaurant was full. That's the way you're supposed to respond. The Haitian restaurant was full. By the way, I've had a lot of Haitian food over the years, right, Mike? Who's, who makes the best Haitian food? Say it. Your mom. <laughs> Mike's mom. I, I'm, that might be debatable in this room, but I believe you. <laughs> and finally, we made it to the Nehemiah Foundation. Nehemiah Foundation on the second day of the three-day trip, but the second day we're in Springfield. Uh, the Nehemiah Foundation is a collective of churches that are working together for city transformation. Sound familiar? I'll tell you what else sounds familiar. They have a courtyard they're trying to beautify so it can bless people. They're working on standing up to bring together the races, race relationships and find healing. And they're, they're working hard and they get canceled for doing that type of work. But the Nehemiah Foundation is full of such a godly atmosphere. And we met with the owners and uh, or the directors, and the executive director said, she said this, right? So a five-minute visit turned into two hours. As Luis and I shared our hearts with them, they shared their hearts with us, and this is what she said, and this is the crux of my message. Everybody listen? You still listening? Yeah. She said, it's a sovereign moment. This is as bad as it gets for Springfield. What if God wants the world to see the Good Samaritan story. She said, what are they going to do with that? She gave me a shirt, Luis and I a shirt, that they all wore as a group that they had planned to wear. And it says, when you do good, in, pray for the good of the city. Pray that God would bless the city. And they had this event, this prayer walk. These are evangelical, charismatic Christians who are out there walking the city of Springfield, believing for God to show up among the Haitian immigrants, among all the families. They're walking around. They scheduled this. And the day they started marching with their prayer shirts was the same day that the Proud Boys had showed up. And they kept up their march and their prayer. And I'm just here to tell you, back from Springfield, Ohio, that there is some believing Christians who are praying their hearts out in the face of evil and believing that God will bring healing to their community in such a powerful way. Amen. Amen. Amen, brother. Amen. Amen. The Samaritan story, when Jesus dropped that info when he told the story about the Good Samaritan, it was a, it was a shock. I'm not even, I'm kind of treading on ground here, actually, and I shouldn't, but like it was a shock to the listeners in Jesus' time for him to say, a Samaritan is the hero of the story? I read a paragraph the other day about 40 churches in a book, about 40 churches that got burned down, burned down. And the group that came together to rebuild them were Muslims. You've been conditioned to not see that they're human beings, but they're human beings. And sometimes God will use the people you don't expect to do some of the most amazing things. And that's starting to get under your skin a little bit. Maybe it's not just because it's annoying, but because it's conviction. So I would ask you, why, why are we living a small life with a small circle? Why do we live in this like little circle of 
I'm in and everybody else is out. Why are we living in this? It's all about my personal salvation. Thank you very much. Why? Let me make up a conversation. Hey, I heard Castle emphasizes a lot of community outreach and justice work. True. That's cool, but what I really want is more Bible study. Opens Bible. Go. Where? Into all the world. Love. Love who? Love God with all your heart and your neighbor as yourself. Why are we so easily afraid of the world? What's scaring you about them? Maybe the next email I'll get is from somebody who says, you know what? The city of Norwich is full of people who are needy. I'm ready to do some business in the city of Norwich, and I'm not going to worry about the other stuff. We got people who need a helping hand, and this church was called to be here to be in a place of salt and light because we care for our neighbors. Remember, dear brothers and sisters, that few of you were wise in the world's eyes or powerful or wealthy when God called you. Instead, God chose things the world considers foolish in order to shame those who think they are wise, who boast, who arrogantly say, look what I do, look what I do, look what I do, that's evil. And he chose things that are powerless. He chose Mary, who was a teenage girl, who said, do what you got to do because I don't have any power, but I believe that you have the power. Church, we're a church of misfits, and I'm so happy that we are. I'll be the chief misfit. I don't even know what that means. I'll figure that out. We can live for worldly accomplishments or God's assignments. We can live for worldly accomplishments or God's assignments, whether it takes you to Springfield or the sidewalk. So let's stand. I'm going to answer the two questions I asked at the beginning. If you can, would you stand? My purpose of this was to try to help you to see that there is an evil that's just as destructive as when Louisa and I, Louisa and I go to Springfield with the destruction I've seen in Honduras and in Haiti and in El Paso and sometimes a spiritual destruction. Are you all listening? Sometimes spiritual destruction is just so hard to get across. It needs the Holy Spirit because our tongues, our tongues can set a fire. How many people have gotten that? Our tongues can set a fire. So I asked you two questions. When you hear the term biblical values, what do you think of? I'm going to give you the answer. Here's one. Here's a biblical value that I'm not saying this is important to me. I'm saying in the scripture, it's important to God. A biblical value is somebody who can control what they say, who can speak with integrity and graciousness and kindness and respect, who can speak life over people and believe that what they say matters. That's a biblical value. And then the other question, where do we find God? We're going to find God. We're going to find God among the... year I'm learning that you find God in the suffering and I just don't know how many Christians I don't say this accusatory I'm giving a challenge it's different when you love your neighbor sometimes you challenge I just don't know how many Christians want to get in the car so to speak to get to Springfield to love a neighbor but you're going to find God in the places where you th- where there's something that's trying to put them down because God's there saying I'm going to lift you up that's where Ruth was working in the fields and Boaz said hey I see Ruth I've heard her story she's not a label she's not just an immigrant 
She's a woman who is caring for her family. And so, and so Boaz said, I'm a protector. Come on, church, let's be more about protecting others than putting them down. Let's be more about, even in our own homes, protect. In our lives, at work, protect with your words. On these streets, stop sharing memes that are putting other people down and think it's just a joke when it's just one tad of evil. Watch what you're saying to my recovery brothers and sisters. Sometimes the battle is partly coming out your mouth. It's what you say. And if you begin to speak the words that God wants you to say and affirm other people, instead of getting into knickknacks, spats, I don't know what I was about to say, spats and fights, and that's the stuff that our tongues set on fire. And we want the fire of the Holy Spirit, but we're setting the wrong kind of fire in the churches. All right, so if you would like to, I'm going to pray, pray for us. If anybody wants to be somebody in their hearts, like this is just a chance to to do two things probably right the first thing would probably be lord forgive me for my own sin <laughs> forgive me for where i say things that i shouldn't say or I, I just let that be said and it's no big deal but it is a big deal maybe that's the first thing lord i pray that you would please forgive us and i pray you cleanse us and i pray you wash us second thing if you want to say lord just send me to to this world that's needy i don't if it's in my own house and i can't get out of my house I'll send a text. I'll make a call. I'm going to go where you've told me to go. Lord, I pray that you would, for those of us who surrender our lives to you, that you would anoint us to go. I pray this in Jesus' name. Thank you for your support. When Luis and I went to Springfield, we saw more than $7,000 come in. We're still raising the funds. I spoke with uh, the foundation, the Nehemiah Foundation director. We communicated about some possibilities the two of them that lead that are going to come here to this church sometime next year a relationship has formed i had a friend of mine who said who knows maybe springfield's not a one-time thing and i believe that god's got more in store for us hey thanks for taking a trip with me let's keep believing that our words make a difference amen <laughs>
Now 